AMD has been playing catch up with Nvidia for years, but just a few weeks ago, they finally released their totally new RDNA architecture for graphics cards, and it seems fine. Honestly, we may be looking more at potential than truly speedy new cards, but there are some features in this new architecture that could, down the line, make for some truly interesting graphics cards. Welcome to Upscaled, our show where we look at the parts that make things fast. We previously took a look at AMD's new processor architecture, Zen 2, and a few of you wanted us to follow up with RDNA, their new graphics card architecture. So here we are. We're going to take a look at what's new in the hardware, new graphics technology, and yes, what is up with ray tracing. There are a few terms floating around here, so let's define them. AMD's previous graphics cards were all part of the Graphics Core Next, or GCN family, which first launched in 2012. GCN has formed the basis for all of AMD's graphics products since then, and crucially, it's also been the backbone of the graphics processing in the PlayStation, the Xbox, and for the past few years, all of Apple's computers. So GCN has been around for seven years, but it hasn't stayed the same. There have been five revisions, all adding new functionality and ending with Vega, a pretty major redesign that launched in 2017 and has formed AMD's flagship top-line card since then. The new architecture that just launched is called RDNA, and the first cards that launched based on it are codenamed Navi, and they include the Radeon RX 5700 and 5700 XT. There's been some debate about whether or not RDNA is actually different enough to count as a new architecture. And part of this stems from AMD's decision to keep GCN's instruction set, which is the fundamental code that GPUs run. But there's good reason for retaining the GCN instructions. AMD partially owes its continuing existence as a company to the products it designs for its partners, with reports saying that Sony had major input on Navi and RDNA. These partner deals have kept AMD afloat through some rough patches. Check out our last episode where we discuss the disastrous bulldozer CPU design, but in this case, it also means that the console makers want a card that maintains backwards compatibility for their games. So RDNA needs to be different enough to be faster and better, but keep enough of GCN's features to be able to run software designed for those cards without major issues. One of the easiest ways to do that was to retain the instruction set. But this isn't as big a setback as it might seem. Instruction sets can easily be updated with new commands to take advantage of new hardware and vice versa without discarding the previous commands older software needed to run. It's like how adding a new word like selfie to the dictionary doesn't mean we have to throw out churl or solace, even though we may use them less. Heck, the x86 instruction set that AMD and Intel CPUs use was first written in 1978, but it's been patched and updated dozens of times, and no one would claim that AMD's new Zen 2 is the same architecture as a Pentium 1 from 1993. AMD has also been pretty clever about introducing new hardware capabilities in a way that won't break the link to the past. And the biggest of these changes has to do with the wavefront. One of the key concepts in GPUs is the idea of an SIMD, or Same Instruction Multiple Data. This is a type of parallel computing where the same operation is applied to a bunch of data all at once, and it's a huge part of graphics and image processing. A super basic SIMD operation might be brightening an image. Each pixel in the image has a brightness value, and you've got a ton of pixels. To brighten the image, you increase that brightness value for every pixel. So there's one instruction, say adding 25 to the brightness, and you're applying it to multiple data points, every pixel in an image. So in an SIMD architecture, this can all be done in one step. Same instruction, multiple data. Rotation, sharpening, blur, and a host of other image processes take advantage of this SIMD design, and it's part of what allows a GPU to churn out 60 frames per second. Even when you can't run an instruction across a whole frame, but only a little chunk of it, splitting up the frame into thousands of batches of instructions still saves a heck of a lot of time over individually processing every one of the over 8 million pixels that goes into a 4K frame. This would be great if jobs could just run through the GPU organized by what instructions they need, but that's not always the case. So GPUs also leverage a related concept called SIMT, or Same Instruction Multiple Threads. Data to be processed is organized in threads, sort of like work orders, and the GPU does its best to arrange them so the same instruction can execute across a host of threads all at once. 
It's like if you're cooking dinner for 100 people, it's easier to make each dish in a big batch, say like a huge pot of potatoes, instead of cooking them one by one. And as long as everyone ends up with a meal, the order you cook the different dishes in doesn't really matter. In GCN, threads, those work orders, were grouped into clusters of 64 called a wave. Side note, NVIDIA does the same thing, calls it a warp. A scheduler would do its best to bundle together jobs that needed the same instruction into a full group of 64, which would then be sent to an SIMD that would process it. GCN's SIMDs could process 16 threads at a time, so over four ticks of the graphics processor, it would work its way through the 64 threads of the wave and be ready for a new set of 64 when it was done. The problem is that this arrangement always executed in lockstep. First, the scheduler might send a full 64 threads to process, which would take four cycles, but then the next pass, it might only have a single thread that needs work, and that would take four cycles too. With everything working perfectly, GCN could keep a lot of data flowing, but any hiccup, which are really pretty inevitable, would lead to a lot of wasted time. Where a lot of computing these days is about processing bigger and bigger chunks of data at once, RDNA actually reduces that wavefront to only 32 threads, but it also increases the SIMD to 32 lanes, which means that while complex jobs that GCN could have handled in one chunk might need to be split in half, RDNA is more likely to run at full capacity more of the time, and it can process a full 32 thread wave every cycle. And to keep compatibility with GCN software, two 32-thread wavefronts can just be fused together to act like the old 64-thread wavefront. GCN's architecture was great for complex sequential instructions, like those used in scientific computing, but this new design is a little more NVIDIA-like and it should be better tuned for graphics. Like everything, code has to be written to actually take advantage of this new architecture, but there is potential for RDNA to process more frames at a more reliable rate, and in some cases, twice as fast as the speed of GCN. Beyond these new cards, AMD is rolling out a few new software features, the most notable being Radeon Image Sharpening, or RIS. Most modern games use anti-aliasing, which slightly blurs the footage in order to eliminate jagged edges. And RAS is a form of contrast-aware sharpening that AMD claims can add detail back to those games. Contrast-aware means it should make the image sharper without adding halos or ring effects you can sometimes see in an over-sharpened image. It can also potentially be used to render a game at a lower resolution and then scale it up to 4K without ending up with a super blurry image. The current implementation is a driver-level feature and is a so-called screen space effect, meaning it applies across the whole frame after it's been rendered. This is sort of like the popular reshade plugin for PC games, but it's a pretty blunt application. In editing terms, it's more like adding an Instagram filter than actually going in and photoshopping a picture. It can't distinguish between the game's interface and the background, for example, and it sometimes over-sharpens things like light effects or reflections, but it's actually surprisingly good. On games like Resident Evil 2 that have a pretty aggressive blur filter, it did a nice job restoring details, and it made fine lines and textures pop in Wolfenstein 2. Beyond just boosting detail, the real secret of this sharpening seems to come from when you use it to scale up footage. Now, you may remember from our Metro Exodus video that NVIDIA has a competing feature called DLSS that also claims to use a giant supercomputer to help scale lower resolution footage up to high res. And well, I generally thought it looked kind of lousy. Like a lot of modern games, Wolfenstein and Metro have a setting that lets you set the game's shader scale, essentially rendering the game at a lower resolution and then stretching it to your display. And in our tests with Radeon image sharpening with both, there seemed to be a sweet spot around 75% where the image sharpening made it look nearly as good as full res and with a big boost in frame rates. Even at 75%, the edges of some objects were slightly rougher, and below 75%, jagged edges and blurred textures just became way too noticeable, but Radeon image sharpening could add an impressive amount of detail. Whereas DLSS softened textures and created some weird pop-in glitches, Radeon image sharpening can add additional grain or over-defined textures, but it generally looked decent. 
Neither of these are ever going to compete with true 4K, and I did find the sharpening on the user interface to be distracting, but AMD is creating a version of this contrast-aware sharpening that developers can implement in the rendering pipeline, which means they can choose what parts of the image to sharpen and not, to avoid sharpening things like your ammo counter health bar. For now, Radeon image sharpening is only available on the 5700 cards, but AMD did detail a way it could work on older hardware, and it remains to be seen if developer implementations require the new cards as well or not. The real limitation is that it doesn't support DirectX 11. It's only currently available on games that support DirectX 12 or 9 and Vulkan. Ultimately, your preference between DLSS and RAS might come down to whether or not you can tolerate an image that looks a little blurry or one with some overly harsh edges. Still, RAS runs on many of the games of the past few years. While DLSS has been announced for a number of games, it's currently supported on three. Of course, the big question is ray tracing, the next generation lighting technology for super realistic games. NVIDIA's first cards supporting it were out a year ago, and RDNA so far does not. AMD claims it has a solution coming, but exactly what that is remains to be seen. Confusingly, the next-gen Xbox and PlayStation, both of which will use RDNA, have both been claiming to support ray tracing, with Xbox even claiming hardware-accelerated ray tracing, but again, it's not entirely clear what they mean. Next-gen ray tracing. It's real-time because it's hardware-accelerated for the first time ever. According to the roadmap AMD released, some form of hardware-based ray tracing will be coming to next-gen RDNA, supporting select lighting effects. These are definitely vague terms, but it may mean ray-traced reflections or shadows, though I doubt it means full ray-traced global illumination throughout an entire scene. Beyond that, they have claimed a cloud-based system for full ray trace scenes will be coming in the future. And this makes sense when you consider that AMD is powering both Google's Stadia and Microsoft's xCloud game streaming services. But it makes a little less sense when you consider that neither of those services are actually planning to use our DNA cards, at least at launch. So for now, where does that leave us? The new 5700 and 5700 XT are decent cards. They probably cost a little too much, even after their price cuts, and their power consumption definitely makes me nervous, but they have a few potential bright spots. For one, they are clocked really fast. They take a lot of electricity and put out a lot of heat getting to those speeds, but the fact that they can hit such high clock speeds says good things about the basic architecture. Power also doesn't scale evenly with speed. It takes a lot of juice to get a card running those last few hundred megahertz. The second thing is their Samsung partnership. AMD is going to be working with Samsung to develop mobile graphics chips, and one of their engineers told us that RDNA was designed to scale from under 5 watts of power to over 300, so there may be an efficiency sweet spot somewhere below the 225 watts that the 5700 XT runs at. That same engineer also told us that RDNA has a lot of design flexibility. GCN couldn't go past 64 compute units, which are the basic processing cores of a GPU, without a major redesign, and it stayed around that limit for years. RDNA has no such limitations. The 5700 XT has 40 compute units, so there is definitely room to grow. Finally, die size. The physical GPU that the 5700 series is using is only 251 millimeters square. NVIDIA's competing 2070 Super card is faster, but it has a 545 millimeter squared chip. Now, I am still distressed that even at 251 millimeters, the 5700 XT is drawing those 225 watts, and it is still slower than the 2070 Super at 175 watts. But it makes me wonder if there isn't a larger die, slower clocked version of RDNA out there somewhere that could be a serious competitor. The worry, though, is that now NVIDIA is a generation behind in fabrication technology, and once they decide to catch up, there just may be no competition at all. Let us know what you think. Have you picked up a 5700 card, or are you waiting for a future release? Do you think these are still a little too expensive, and would they be worth it to you maybe for $50 less? Let us know what you think, and any future topics you want us to cover. And be sure to hit subscribe. We have a lot more bits of tech to talk about coming up soon.